In this video lecture, I will discuss variable selection. Here's some notation. Let the graphic S indicate the set of variables that we include in the model. In particular, S is a subset of the integers from 1 up to B. So if we include variables 1, 3, and 5, S will be the set 1, 3, 5. This set will be helpful to indicate from our variables of um, regressors which ones actually we are including. So if I write x, i, and then a second subscript s, that indicates that it takes those elements out of this vector that corresponds to those j's, or r, and s. So x, i, s are really the, observ the i's of observation of the variables, for instance, 1, 3, and 5. Same idea if we write a capital boldface x with a subscript s, it indicates that we take those columns out of x. So that allows us to, for instance, write a also a subfactor of, of beta, which only corresponds to those variables as beta subscript s. And we can define the least squares estimator of that subfactor in terms of these x subscript s matrices, which only include those columns corresponding to the, to the variables we speak in, we choose. So the goal of variable selection is simply to determine an appropriate s. Well, what is an appropriate s? Well, for that we need to bench find a benchmark. And our benchmark is what we call the oracle. So the oracle is the all-knowing entity. So there are two oracles given here on the slide. The first is from ancient Greece, the Oracle of Delphi, which could predict the future. The second one is a bit more modern, that's Paul the Octopus, who about 10 years ago showed remarkable uh, ability in predicting the outcome of football games. He predicted, for instance, on the, the World Cup in 2010, he predicted many games correctly. So what these have in common is that they somehow magically seem to know the truth. So that is also what the general oracle for us does. So if in fact our model is really linear and really sparse, so the beta has many zero elements, then what the oracle knows actually what we call S0, the true set of relevant variables. So it knows which of these variables actually have beta coefficients which are not zero. Now, this means that we would have to assume that the model is truly linear, which we might not always want. But we can actually extend the idea to where the true model is not linear or not fully sparse. Uh, where we, what the oracle can do is pick the best model from the set of linear models uh, that is in one way or another closest to the true one. So we can define some distance between models and uh, the oracle knows how to pick the best one according to that distance. Of course, once we've made this mapping from by the oracle from like the true non-linear world to a linear sparse world, because that's what the oracle is doing, is picking the best sparse model that is uh, uh, appropriate. We're basically, we basically can assume again that we're in the linear framework and we have a true model. So we're going to, I'm just going to work mostly with this setup where we have a truly sparse and linear model where the Oracle knows uh, the true set of relevant variables. And um, this is going to be the, the setup for the most of the discussion. But keep in mind that we can see this actually as an approximation via this argument. But this is why we, we need uh, this oracle. Now, there, you can roughly discern three ways of subset selection or uh, variable selection. Um, the first one is, the, 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 I think, the most common one, which is so-called best subset selection which is essentially you search over all possible models and you have some criterion to decide on what is the best and you uh, 
basically choose, according to your criterion, the best model over all models. And this is a general way we do uh, model selection. In particular, one thing we use, for instance, is information criteria. Another thing that you do is cross-validation. Um, so this is something that we are going to be looking at uh, here. The other approaches are a bit, a bit more pragmatic because searching over all models is generally complicated. So what we could also do is we could do what we call in econometrics, typically specific to general, but the, in statistics it's called forward selection, where you start from a small model which only includes those variables you definitely want to have in, maybe only an intercept. And then you start recursively adding variables. So you add a variable, you check, is your model okay? If not, you add another variable. You can also go the other way around. You start from a very big model, the full model, and then you start deleting variables until you reach some sort of sufficient um, model. Now, I will discuss all three in turn, and I will show that actually none of them are suitable in high uh, dimensions. So let's first look at, at uh, best subset selection and use information criteria to do so. So the idea behind information criteria is to find the balance between fit, how well does your model fit your data, and model complexity. Because what you want to avoid is overfitting, fitting your data too well. Now, the way we do that is we put penalties on not making our model too complex. Specifically, not including too many variables in this context. So the information criteria in general form look like this. It's the uh, minus two times the log likelihood of uh, your parameter vector for that particular model, so indicated by S, plus a penalty term, where a penalty term penalizes if the model becomes more complicated. In the variable selection case, it simply means if you include more variables. So here the absolute values of a set is actually not an absolute value, but it denotes the cardinality. So how many elements are there in that set, or how many variables did you include in your model? Now we often calculate this assuming normality, and then we get this familiar form where we get the, uh, the log of the um, residual uh, sum of squares, and we get an error term. And we simply do this over all possible models, S, and we choose the one which minimizes this information criteria. So here we can again explicitly see the two terms. We get uh, first term measures how well the model fits, or actually how well what does is not fitting because it looks at the residuals. So this part you want to minimize. Minimize means better fit. On the other hand, we have the complexity, how many variables do we include in a model? And you also want to put a penalty on that, you also want to minimize that. Now, so there's only a trade-off, and how you choose the trade-off is determined by what I call here CN which is the actual penalty. So if you make this very large, that means you, highly, you put a high penalty on complexity and you will choose smaller models. If you make it small, you will tend to choose larger models because the first term, the fit, will dominate. So two particular uh, forms which, which are very, very um, often occurring are the Akaiki information criterion, also called AIC, which puts CN equal to two, and the Schwartz information criterion, which is sometimes called the, the Bayesian information criterion as well, which puts CN to LN of N. So this one puts a larger value than the Akaiki, which means that you put stronger penalty here. So if you use big, you will tend to choose smaller models than if you use AIC. Now the big problem, of course, is if you need to evaluate this for every model, it means that you must for every regressor, every J decide, do you put it in or out of your model? Which means you have two to the power P models to evaluate. Which is of course doable if you have five regressors, but if you have a hundred of them, it's, become, it's going to become an awful mess. So if P is large, this is simply not a feasible strategy. So there are some cases actually where it works, and these are also usually the cases where, where we use this approach, such as other regressive models, where things are nested. So you, you would say, I'm going to include 
always first. I start with I'm going to include the first lag of the of my data, and then I'm going to look at the second lag. But I would never include only the second, but not the first. So you would then only include the third if you include the first and second and so on. So that means that you only have to do p models. Same idea you could do pol for polynomial regression for the example that I um, discussed in the lecture about uh, cursive dimensionality. In that, those cases, you can do it, but in general, you cannot. I mean, we generally don't have these cases um, in, in, that we in high dimensional uh, statistics. And there's another issue because if P becomes close to N, well, I mean, look at, at the, the, the fit thing, it will become super unreliable because we can, with P equal to N, we can fit our data perfectly. So you get very strange results when you get reach P close to N. And if p becomes larger than n, it, it even is becomes impossible. So you would, would anyways need to put on a restriction saying, I want to have at most p star variables in my model, and this should be significantly smaller than n for this to work. Now we might think of a different way of, of, of evaluating fit. And that is by looking at other sample validation. This is something we typically do, in particular if we're interested on, in forecasting and prediction. So what we want there is say, well, suppose we would have two subsamples available. One subsample, which we call the estimation sample or in machine learning terminology, the training sample, is used to estimate your model. Now, if you were not overfitting, so if you were really capturing the true model, the, the signal and not the noise, then if you would use that estimation to predict a second part, another sample, then it should still work well. Whereas if you were actually fitting noise and overfitting, you would not be able to do that in a, in a good way. So if we had two samples, if we had the second sample, we could simply use that strategy, right? We estimate on the first and check if it still works on the second. And if it does, that would be an indication that indeed we're actually fitting a model that is appropriate. So this could prevent you from doing overfitting or fitting too large models uh, without having to, to, to go into the issue of the information criteria not working anymore. Of course, there's a problem that you know, based on how you split your data, it might be by chance that it either works well or does not work well in this part. So it's not a good idea generally to just do that only for one particular sample because it's will be very uh, unreliable and, and depending on, on those particular data. So what we instead do is cross-validation. So it uses the same idea, but it basically does that then more often by looking at different splits of your data. So one in particular thing that we look at is k-fold cross-validation, which what it does is it splits your data of n observations randomly into k equal parts. So you assign all of your observations to k, one of these k parts, also called folds, which is where the name is coming from. Typically this is done randomly, although you could do that in a slightly different way. And then once you've split your data into those k folds, you're going to use k minus one of them, say the first k minus one, to estimate the models that you're interested in. And you're going to use the final uh, part, final fold, the k subsample, you're going to use that to, to evaluate how well your model works. So you're going to do to, to a prediction and record some sort of loss function. Uh, typically, that would be a squared prediction error. And well, this is still the same as we had in the previous slide. So we're going to do something more, we're now going to repeat that exercise, but then choose, say, subsample k minus one to do not estimate on, but to evaluate on. And you do that until you have all combinations. And then, of course, you, you average over all the k iterations that you did, and that gives you the, uh, the model with the lowest uh, prediction error. Right, so graphically, it looks like this. You split your data into five folds here. Uh, First, you use the first four for estimation and the fifth for prediction and evaluating the prediction. 
Well, then you redo it, but you use the fourth one instead for prediction. So now you use the fifth one as well for estimation and so on. So you have five iterations to be done here. Of course, it brings us to the question, how do we actually choose K in practice? Uh, well, you don't want to choose uh, K either too small or too large. If you choose it too small, you will lose too many data for, for estimation. Uh, but if you choose it too large, then actually your estimation will be very similar across all these folds. And uh, you will only have, you have too few data to evaluate on. Now, common choices are k is 5 and k is 10, which is mostly just by, by convention why people choose these. There's one other form that's interesting to look at, and that is k is equal to n minus 1, which means here you, you, you use only a single observation to evaluate on. But you, of course, do it then for each, you run over all your whole sample n times. This is called leave one out because you leave only one observation out. Now, this is particular in non-parametric estimation, a good, a good approach, but in regression models, five and 10 are more common ways to go. Now, there are some issues also with cross-validation. I mean, there's, I think one of the nice things is that it's, it's a very non-parametric idea because you're not really assuming any any models and not no penalty, arbitrary penalties and information criteria and so on. One of the main drawbacks of cross-validation is that it's really only valid for IID data because you're randomly assigning data to faults. Um, and that is of course not very good if you have, for instance, time series uh, setting. Now you might say, okay, I don't do it randomly, but I really do like the first in time, I could say the first 20% goes into fold one, second 20% goes into fold two. That would obviously be better, but still, you would end up with awkward situations where you would, for instance, you're in the third iteration, use data from the first two periods and the last two periods to predict what happens in the middle. So that's a bit weird. So this first one, of course, makes more sense uh, to consider. Now, what people do in, in, in time series is more a rolling window. So you only do one direction, past to future, and then you do either recursive or rolling window uh, forecasting. So for instance, we could start here, use estimation on the first part of the sample and then do prediction on, on the second part. And then you move on here, do estimation on the first two parts and prediction on the third part, and so on, using the first three to predict the fourth, and using the first four to predict the fifth. This obviously is more logical and treatment and would be in a way as if you were moving toward, through time and getting more and more data available. Now, the, the other main problem is that it's computationally very intensive. It, doesn't, it still requires you to evaluate all these two to the power P models, but now you have to even do it K times because we do reiterate over these faults. So, of course, in high dimensions, this is really not going to uh, be a lot of fun. So can we do differently? Can we do something which is less computationally intensive? So that's the, one of the ideas behind forward selection. So you start from a small model, say you intercept only, or maybe you include some variables that uh, you want definitely to be in your model. And then you're going to add variables to that model. Now, what you then do is in every step, you're going to include a single variable. So you have some sort of selection procedure. How do you choose a variable? For instance, it, you take the variable that most improves the fit. You also need to decide on how to stop. So you start adding variables based on your selection rule. And every time then you evaluate if your moral is accurate. So you have to find, come up with a rule for that. So some, for instance, some rules you could do is look at specification test. Uh, is my model looking, looking okay in terms of all sorts of, of specification testing? Or what's very common is to say, well, is the explanatory power of the variable I added last actually doesn't still matter. So you could test whether there, there is a significant improvement in explanatory power. Well, the main problem with this method is that it's what is called greedy. 
So you're not looking at an overall best choice, but every time you're going to make the best choice at that moment, but you're never going to go back from that choice. Which means that you, you there's a risk that once you set on a certain path, you stay on that path, you don't reconsider, so you may end up being on the wrong path. And so you might, for instance, you're in a certain situation that, that given where you are now, it would be best to include variable A. So you include A, but uh, with A included, the path might go in a certain direction where you don't want to have B and C. But on the other hand, if instead of A, you would have included B and C, you would be much better off leaving A out. You can never go back to that situation because you have already included A and you don't look back anymore. So there's a big risk that you end up on a wrong path uh, using this approach. So we can do it vice versa, the other direction. Uh, backward selection, or you're starting from general and then moving to specific. Now this is in that sense better. Uh, it's, it's definitely safer than forward selection, but it also has its problems. So what we do here is we start first with the big model, the general model where you put all your variables in, and then you're going to delete variables. So you again need a rule to decide, to decide which variables to delete. So for instance, you can do a, a, a t-test on the significance for all of the variables and delete the one which is the, the least significant. Um, then you also need a rule to stop again. So for instance, you could say if I'm do, doing t-test then at some point where all of these statistics are significant, you stop, you don't delete any variables anymore. Now, in this case, we actually are doing a lot of hypothesis testing, and this is often the case with backward selection methods. But that means that actually error probabilities accumulate. So this is related to the multiple testing problem, where every time you do tests, so you, you're not actually controlling error anymore. It also has big problems in high dimensions because you know the first step already doesn't work. The largest, the most general model, suppose you would want to do estimate that using these squares, you basically already uh, cannot do that any, any, anymore. So this one also will not actually give you a proper solution for high dimensional. So this one actually also will not give you a proper solution for high dimensional sadness. Therefore, we need to look at uh, other methods. And in particular, we want to keep the variable selection idea, but we want to do it in a way that is feasible in high uh, dimensions. And that will be the topic of the um, penalized regression lectures.